benefit of an integrated weed management approach is we can delay evolution of resistance or you know we're throwing multiple things at it and so if one doesn't stick you know something else will so using all these little bitty hammers that can all work on it at the same time but uh, still control that weed species and we're not selecting for resistance or putting all the effort on one method and if that one method fails then we're you know out of luck so that's really the benefit of having those multiple little hammers in a, in a integrated approach you know one of the first things i want to mention is with our team approach to soybean weed management project is one of the major benefits is that we can pull together the expertise and experience um, from multiple different weed scientists within the university. Uh, so there's actually four of us on this project, um, Drs. Jason Norsworthy, Neil DeBurgos, Tom Barber, and myself. Um, and so each one of us is able to kind of pool together our you know, previous experiences, our own unique research, uh, and then our ideas and thoughts on what recommendations we really want to move forward to our soybean producers in the state of Arkansas. Um, and so one of the first things that we wanted to, to say right away is thank you to our soybean producers and to the Soybean Promotion Board for that funding because without it, we wouldn't have the research, we wouldn't be able to have the science-based information to, to be able to provide these recommendations that we do. Um, through the soybean you know, checkoff dollars and the soybean promotion board, we've identified Palmer amaranth resistant to six different modes of action in the state already now. Um, it's very common to have glyphosate resistance, um, the group threes or the yellow herbicides resistance, as well as ALS inhibitors. And then now recently in the past few years, HPBD inhibitor resistance has, has developed more, PPO inhibitor resistance has continually grown, and now the most recent one is we've confirmed the group 15 resistance in the state in a few different counties. Um, so we're really you know, starting to get limited on some of those options, uh, especially for Palmer amaranth, just because we have so much resistance that's evolved out there. But we have continued research looking at identifying these and, and mapping out the distributions of where these are located across the state to try and help our growers out so they know, you know if the resistance is there in their areas. Um, so one of the new resistance mechanisms happens to be this metabolic resistance where the plants basically can digest the herbicide and survive these new rates. And that's really been a new wrinkle in our system that's made it challenging to control some of these weeds because that's a whole nother ball game basically for trying to uh, evolve resistance and then on our side trying to manage that resistance. So it's very challenging, but part of this research project is identifying that and getting better ideas on how we can successfully manage it. We've really developed a lot of different integrated weed management practices that we, we can follow to help us with managing such a prolific weed like Palmer Amaranth. Um, some of those strategies, you know, include in the fall doing a deep tillage event every about four years doing crop rotation, if, especially in soybeans, if we can rotate to rice and it's flooded rice, flood it out, you yeah. know, we can flood it out and, and, and kill off a year's worth of Palmer pigweed that year without hopefully having seed return to the seed bank. There's all kinds of other options right now, like cover crops that mm -hmm. we continue to investigate and having something on top of the soil surface to just eliminate you know, light making it to those seeds and having them germinate. And so we have to have multiple effective modes of action, otherwise we're just selecting for resistance. And the biggest thing that we can do is throw out residual herbicides up front and just try and never let that, that pigweed get out of the ground. So there's a lot of options there, and like I mentioned, it's, it's, it's taking the little hammer approach to try and manage this pigweed moving forward because there is not going to be a silver bullet, there's not going to be this one big hammer that just eliminates it for us in the field anymore. You know, other than that though, there are other equipment type um, practices that we're looking into to try and manage this. For example, the harvest weed seed destructor or um, also just um, harvest weed seed control in general. So it's not necessarily a mechanical means of you know, tilling, but it's a mechanical means of actually crushing those seeds and making them non-viable so that if they go through the combine, we're not spreading them out the back. They're actually being destroyed and we're eliminating them at that time. Um, the same goes for the other harvest weed seed control like narrow windrow burning. So if we take the back of that combine and we take all that shaft and put it in this narrow row and we're able to burn it, it makes those seeds again non-viable and we're not returning the seed to the seed bank and just continually making a worse problem for ourselves because we're stopping the seed production part of it. You know, any more weed control is a long-term game. This is a very long-term game, and, and, right? And yeah, and so managing this stuff from a long-term perspective like that is really the way we got to change our minds and focus. That it'll help us out down the road. It may be challenging now, and we may, you know, not not do great this year. But man, if it can help us two, three, four years down the road, it's going to make our farm a lot more successful and profitable at that point. 
we've been taking water samples uh, that people are using as spray water from across the state and sampling them for pH and water hardness. The reason this can be important is because a lot of our herbicides uh, like to be in an acidic environment and they like to be in relatively you know, soft water. So the, the cations and things in there aren't tying up our herbicides so that they can't actually go do their job. So if we, if we know ahead of time that we have you know, a high pH or we have really hard water, we can try and manage that a little bit to help our herbicides out so they can be more active. Something that happens to work very well is adding um, ammonia sulfate or AMS to the spray tank. What that basically does is the AMS latches onto those free cations like calcium or magnesium and ties it up so then when we put something in into the spray more, tank more it's more effective because it's available it's right. it's free moving then because the other area where ph we've noticed has become a big issue as well is the volatility of several components we've seen if we get more too acidic it can increase the volatility of several of our herbicides which increases off-target movement and leads into a whole lot of other issues there as well so understanding that spray water can be a pretty big deal from multiple avenues so another area that we're moving forward with too is as far as research goes and trying to investigate as far as increasing our weed control into the future is a lot of the different new equipment and technologies that are available out there and becoming more popular. So things like the, the harvest weed seed destructor that we've talked about before. Um, so we have ongoing research with that uh, up at the Newport Research Station or Extension Center. Um, we have ongoing research with the sea and spray technology from Blue River, so where we actually have you know, cameras identifying weeds in the field and it triggers a nozzle to spray and only cover the plants that it identifies so you can have a large savings on herbicide input costs because you're only spraying where you have weeds Very visible. accurately, yeah, it's yes. unbelievable. Ex it's exactly, cool. yeah. Um, there's things like autonomous equipment that's even available now, so there's, there's companies that will um, bring out a sprayer that's not manned and it's all basically operated on you know GPS and prescription maps that they may put in and it can completely spray or till a field you know without anybody operating the equipment out there it's all based on GPS and, and that technology um, and so it's really it, it's we're definitely moving into a 21st century of technology it's with 2020 that kind of stuff. yeah <laughs> it's uh, it's 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 insane to see it working. It's, uh, it's, it's really crazy where we're going with some of that technology mm -hmm. available to manage weeds in the future. Uh, we continue work too, looking at different uh, UAVs, you know, um, the drones and everything else and how that may help us with, you know, either identifying weeds in the field or identifying potential herbicide injury through um, crop response, you know, the, all the different sensors that we have between NDVI, thermal, you know, those kinds of things. There's ongoing projects there. Yeah, nothing's out of the question, right? <laughs> right, exactly. That, that's a great way to put it. Nothing is out of the question. It's, it's if you can dream it, it's, there's something there that yeah. we could probably do. Um, spray volume work, you know, trying to see increasing spray volume, decreasing spray volumes. Um, any more, you know, other new technologies like pulse width modulation sprayers, the pulsing sprayers and how that impacts our weed control. And then both from a ground and an aerial based application. In Arkansas, we have a lot of aerial applications that go out across the state and uh, trying to identify ways that we can constantly improve applications from both ground and aerial is critical to make sure that we're maximizing those chemical control methods, especially with a beast of a weed like Palmer Amaranth. It's, it's critical to really maximize each and every one of those strategies that we're using. So moving forward, we're, we're really trying to investigate and work a lot of those new technologies into our research so that we have recommendations when they become more commercially available. Right. We want to be on the front end of this. Again, I just want to you know, thank the Arkansas Soybean Promotion Board for their, for their continued funding for, for this research. It really allows us a lot of opportunities to investigate different strategies, new equipment, uh, and provide these recommendations to help with our weed control strategies moving forward. And we're going to definitely continue working hard and working uh, a lot of these new equipment technologies out to both identify future, you know, things that we can use for weed control, but still work on identifying some of the old standbys, you know, what herbicides still work, where do we have resistance, what's it resistant to, and why is it becoming resistant. And so we have a lot of, a lot of research ideas moving forward, and it's, it's going to be continuing to work for the Arkansas soybean producer. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thanks for your time. This is very entertaining and educating as usual, uh, and I'll talk to you soon. Well, sounds good. Thank you very much. Thanks.